Oh, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Um, the title of my speech today is Beyond Multiculturalism, and uh, it's the future that I want to talk about. Now, one of the most invigorating and exciting aspects of UKIP is that it tackles head-on what most of the country outside the Westminster bubble sees as cultural issues of crucial importance and is not afraid to talk about the kind of country that we are, we have been, and indeed want to be in the future. Now, high on that list of issues is British identity and where it stands after many years of multiculturalism. So before we go any further, we should make clear what is meant by the term multiculturalism, for there remains a huge amount of confusion about this. It is not about people of different ethnicities and religions living together. Britain has always welcomed people of all cultures and creeds and continues to do so. British people and UKIP are only too happy to acknowledge the contribution of those who have chosen to make Britain their home. But the doctrine of multiculturalism is something quite different. Put simply, it was the belief that integration was not necessary and indeed almost not desirable and that all cultures should rightly be retained in full with little or no requirement to adopt to the host country. In everyday life, this doctrine has been unthinkingly applied while those with serious concerns about it have been portrayed at the very least as being negative and at the very worst as nasty and bigoted. Of course, this is not just unfair, but hugely inaccurate. But such is the cultural atmosphere which has been created, arguing against multiculturalism has for too long required a bravery and a riskiness which it is just unfair to expect of most people. It is certainly true, however, that multiculturalism is being increasingly questioned on both the right and left of the political spectrum. Why, even David Cameron has said that, in hindsight, its imposition has led to more problems than successes. However, it remains stubbornly in place in much of our society, exerting an influence throughout our media, our arts, and our educational fields, all those areas which create the cultural atmosphere in which we live. The public sector, and especially local councils, remain the strongest bastions of a kind of unthinking political correctness in regard to this issue. Even a phrase as innocuous and uncontentious as our way of life, which UKIP proudly and rightly uses in its statements of principles and belief, has become enough for some people to feel uncomfortable or embarrassed. Now, how did we arrive at this situation? Well, those who championed multiculturalism were motivated by a number of things. First of all, there were those who had the genuine, but I would say perhaps naive belief that as all cultures and peoples were one together, we as a country should be borderless and we had a duty to lead the way. Then there were those, however, whose motivations, I would say, were born of something less idealistic. These were the people who were slaves to guilt about Britain's past, who had a distaste for the whole idea of nationhood, and British nationhood in particular. British history was something to be disowned and ashamed of. The default position of this group can be, appear to be one of immense self-loathing. But whatever the mo uh, motivation, there can be no question that taken together, these different strands have had a far-reaching effect. We have a situation now where in many of our towns and cities, distinct groups of people live side by side, but barely mixing. We find ourselves in a position where some cultural practices, which are abhorrent to our values and way of life, such as honor killings, female genital mutilation, and forced marriage, are all too prevalent and indeed seemingly tolerated. And we also find ourselves in a time where a former bishop, Archbishop of Canterbury, no less, can suggest that we should get used to the inevitability of Sharia law operating outside British law. Yes, we are living within a culture in which the taking of offense is treated as a human rights violation. And we have a society which seems to live in a permanent state of cultural cringe, whereby we are encouraged to believe that pride in Britain 
and our culture is automatically exclusive or even worse racist and should therefore be discouraged. And all too often, too many of those who should be protecting our values and traditions appear only too ready to dilute and compromise them. So, put together, these things paint a serious and worrying picture. But as I said earlier, qualms about multiculturalism have been increasingly voiced, and this is encouraging. But it brings us to the question, uh, if not multiculturalism, then what? Well, the answer for the future is unity, national unity through integration. Integration into our way of life and a full acceptance of British values and traditions. So, how can we do this? Well, we must promote an overarching, unifying British culture which is open and inclusive to anybody who wishes to identify with Britain and British values, regardless of ethnic and religious background. America has a very successful society in this respect because while it's multi-ethnic, it is not multicultural. It has an overarching sense of itself and its culture. But the truth is that at the moment, integration of this sort is surely impossible. The level of continuing mass immigration into, break, into Britain make it a practical impossibility. And indeed, it's even not a necessity for those coming in who find ready-made communities. They simply do not need to integrate. This is why UKIP's stated aim of a freeze on all further economic migration is so important. Such a moratorium would give us a vital breathing space during which the dysfunctional migration system could be repaired. And then we can turn our attention to what integration means in practice. We can examine what we require of those who come to our country, but also what we think of ourselves as British people. First of all, we must challenge at every point and then reject the negativity about our country, which has become far too entrenched and is taken as the natural way of looking at things by far too many in our political and cultural establishment. Because after all, you cannot expect people to integrate into something which appears to be despised. Healthy self-criticism is one thing, but a spirit-sapping loss of confidence in our national identity is quite another. Westminster politicians rarely talk about these sort of issues. So, as the newest party in Britain, a party from the grassroots, UKIP is brilliantly positioned to break this tradition and challenge damaging cultural habits. Our spokesmen and our elected representatives should take on this knee-jerk, lazy and destructive approach at every opportunity. They should do this in the knowledge that the majority of the public, the people outside the metropolitan bubble, retain an instinctive pride in this country, its history and its achievements. We saw this only last year during the great celebrations of the Diamond Jubilee and the Olympics. Now, British patriotism has often been characterized as unassuming and gentle almost to the point of being invisible. Certainly there are many who have a romantic attachment to that notion. David Cameron has, after all, said, we do not do flags. However, perhaps the time really has come when such a reticent approach no longer works in the modern world and in such changed circumstances. Perhaps the time has come when we really should do flags. Perhaps we should... <laughs> perhaps we should encourage all our schools to display a union flag and a picture of our monarch, for it is in schools that society is formed. <laughs> the importance of history as a fundamental binding force has been recognised and it's being restored gradually in our education system. But there is more that we can do to restore a sense of our country as being a family. There should be many more national occasions on which all of us, of all ethnic and religious groups, can come together in the way we did so successfully last year. Perhaps the time has come not to wait just for royal events, brilliant though they are, 
but to institute perhaps an annual festival of Britain, which celebrates both our history and our achievements, past and present. If a common history binds our society together, then a common language is its vital, basic glue. All UK school children should be encouraged to learn to speak English. The lack of insistence on the learning of English for newcomers has intensified a damaging tendency towards division. We should require that people coming to Britain learn English as a basic requirement of social cohesion. The time has come too to end the use of multilingual formatting on official application forms at a notional and lateral level. Next, there are our values. There's been much discussion of British values in recent times, none of which has amounted to much. This is because uh, there are a few societies in the world which would not also claim to value concepts such as compassion, decency, or tolerance. However, not all can lay claim to putting the highest value on freedom of speech, a fundamental British value, indeed a birthright. In place of the, in place of the, thank you. In place of the insidious cultural relativism and misplaced sensitivities of the past, we should make it unequivocally clear that freedom of speech is non-negotiable. There must be no curtailment. There must be no curtailment, whether it be in the broader public arena or in the more specialist creative and artistic fields on freedom of expression. It must make, be made completely clear that there exists no law against the giving of offence, and neither is there a right not to be offended. <laughs> Next, it is vital to spell out what we in Britain will and will not tolerate. So far, there's been a destructive lack of will and clarity in this respect. But there should be zero tolerance for cultural practices such as honour killings, female genital mutilation, and forced marriages, all of these harmful practices which go right against our values and indeed our law. <laughs> Do you know, the uh, cultural relativism, coupled with a basic dislike of Britain, which characterises so many on the liberal left, has meant that it is they who stayed silent on these issues. In their absence, it is up to us to state clearly and firmly that if a practice or tradition goes against our law or our values, then we will not tolerate it. And indeed, we must uphold the integrity of British law. A country with parallel and conflicting systems of law ceases to be a cohesive society in any meaningful sense. We must rigorously challenge the notion that the practice of Sharia law in the UK is somehow inevitable as was claimed by the former Archbishop of Canterbury. We reject that claim that such a development is unavoidable. <laughs> the rule of law must apply to everybody equally, and that law is British law. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when we're asked to talk about Britishness and uh, British identity, it is common for people to look perplexed for a while and then uh, mumble something about cups of tea, fish and chips, and obsession with the weather and everything. Well, those things are all very nice, but they don't get us very far. The problems I've outlined this morning highlight the need for us as Britons to draw markers in the sand to say, this is who we are, this is what we believe, and this is what we will not tolerate. I believe that our political class is not equal to this task. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, UKIP has everything to gain and nothing to lose by grasping this nettle. Thank you. <laughs>